Um, I'm Catherine McKinnell. I'm the chair of the petitions committee. I'm an MP in Newcastle. And I just wanted to say congratulations on your petition because clearly it's been very successful. And thank you for taking the time today as well to talk to us at the petitions committee um, because we're having our hearing from ministers and from experts in this field. So it's really, really helpful to talk to you as the lead petitioner and yeah. someone that takes a particular interest in this issue. And I have to say, I take a particular interest in this issue as well, being a Newcastle MP and our region in the Northeast has the highest proportion of pupils eligible for free school meals. So yeah. it's an important issue, I absolutely agree. So the power of petitions means that it does enable people to tell their story directly in Parliament rather than always having to go through politicians. So really this is for you to talk to us and I was hoping that you'd be able to tell us something about why you think this long-term plan to tackle child poverty um, is an issue that you've dedicated yourself to. Um, for me it's about, um, I've learned so much like about the issue over the last year or so and um, the same points keep occurring to me from the families and and the children themselves and um, and I can only go off that and my own experiences and why I think it needs to it needs to change and um, like they're, they're quite similar to what I was going through and and what a lot of the children are going through now um, and the parents are going through it's a similar situation and in a lot of cases it's even worse than than um the situation that I was in so it's um it's definitely something that I'm I'm sure needs to there needs to be some sort of change and we've already taken some steps in the right direction but just because we've done that it doesn't mean that we're at the finish line because you know for me we're, we're still quite a quite a distance from that um so the the structure of it needs to it needs to put the children in a position where they can progress their own lives and um i've used the phrase putting them on the on the starting blocks um because i feel like when i was younger i started behind um a lot of other other children that was you know that wanted to become footballers for example which was which was my situation and um whatever it is that kids aspire to to be when they're older um i believe that whichever area they're from, it shouldn't have an effect on, on um, you know, the opportunities. Um, and setting up this structure is the, 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 the biggest thing that we can do for, for children at the moment. So um, I think going forward, and I, I understand it's not gonna be, it's not everything's gonna change at once, um, but I'm willing to take the, take the steps in order for it to, to have the long-term effect that he needs to have. Well, I guess you've got good experience of those incremental steps that train you to get to where you need to be. So um, what what would you like to see in terms of changes to the free school meal? Because I know you've called for a review, um, a full review of the yeah. system and your petition specifically asked for the government to follow the national food strategy recommendations and expand yeah. access. And I've seen recent um, a study by the Child Poverty Action Group that says that two in five children living below the poverty line aren't actually even entitled to free school meals because the threshold is so high at the moment or, or low, if you like. Um, what would you like to see change? Um, I've got a few. The main point is that um, children and the, the families, they shouldn't be living to deadlines. Um, I think they need assurances that when they fall they're going to be you know they're going to have someone to lean on they're going to be protected um if worse comes to worse um so that the review of the system it needs to put them things in place like if the worst thing happens for example like coronavirus um where does it leave these families and it's left them with with nothing basically and um you know when i started it that's what i've seen and that was i always had a sort of a hunger and a desire to do it but seeing the effects that it had um during coronavirus it it, it made me have to speed things up um and i think that they should have been 
on top of that before anybody else before anybody else was really and um there should have been things in place from whenever they thought the virus was was going to be serious enough for people to lose jobs and um people's income to go down schools to be short um stuff like that they should have had things in place to assure people that they're not going to hit rock bottom and have no help because too many people that I've spoke to and and um the the families and the children they they hit that point and they've had to build themselves back up um on their own and for me it's not it, that's not not fair um because it's no fault of their own that the virus occurred so using using what's happened in the past year as an example that's that's where the system needs to be reviewed because um like i said before they need to be protected from these these issues that, that can occur so um there's there's a few other there, there is the three points that we asked for they give us two but what what people don't recognize is that this by not getting that extra point it's one point i think close to 1.8 million children are still um you know not not getting the meals that they need and um it's just not it, so it seems like we've taken steps forward but in my mind we've we've um you know we've got a million miles to go still and um i think once they do review it they're going to see themselves for themselves really and the more that they have closer contact to the to the people that they're helping the i think the more likely they are to make change because um i'm not sure whether it's a you know a lack of understanding or um maybe just people not not um knowing people that have been through the issue or um having enough feedback from the people that have gone through the issue i don't know what it may be but it needs to change because people aren't comfortable with speaking out about it and that's why the system definitely needs needs to be be changed really and um yeah just i i just want to give the main thing for me is giving them hope and um assuring them that the the government are listening and the the trying to understand more and more which for me it was a step that they've not taken before in the past um so i'm i was happy that they you know was willing to to take that step but now it's about the the future now and um yeah that's what needs to be needs to be fixed I mean, you said there um, that obviously this has been a long term issue and really the situation with the pandemic has just highlighted what is wrong with the system in terms of supporting children and families. And I think um, and I think that's really important point that you make, that it's it's not just about free school meals and it's not just about the pandemic. It's about creating a much broader safety net for children and families what um what do you think we need to like put in place what things specific things do you, would you hope that the government would be looking at that would be able to achieve that um i think we need baselines so if you make sure that you know for example all uh, children in the uk are guaranteed like a meal a day like guaranteed it'll take a lot of stress off the the parents um the children children when, when you're a child, you don't think about it. So I remember when I was younger, I just used to play out all day and then I'd go home and if there was food there, I'd eat it. If there wasn't, I'd, I'd go to sleep and you just get on with your day. But the long-term effect, like you're missing out on a lot of vital stuff that they may or may not need in the future, but it's, it's for them to make that decision. So I remember sometimes I used to... Um, like just, I used to go fall asleep like in the mornings and. Um, was that at know, home never... or at at school? No, at school when. when yeah, because we I think school. that's 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 one of the things you hear from teachers is that the children, if they've come without breakfast, they yeah. just struggle to concentrate. It's really yeah, hard to concentrate at school. Like when when you wake up for school, you you know it's going to be a long day already, and then to say I say for example, I wanted to be. I don't know, a lawyer or something. And I needed to get that education. Um, like I wouldn't have been able to do it. But 
like for me, I, I didn't want to be that. So um, it's not that school was any less important to me because I still wanted to do things like get all my GCSEs, be able to um, get an, a different job in case football failed and stuff like that. But um, for other kids that, might aspire to be that it's impossible to to learn and to develop in 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 that type of um environment you know if you're hungry and you can't concentrate or you've not got the right foods um it's difficult to to go to school and learn for four or five hours um you know it'll be difficult to do that as a 20 year old or a 25 year old so for children to do it it's it's even more difficult and so that's one thing. And we've spoke about the review of the, the free school meal system. Um, there's stuff like the, the supermarket vouchers. Like a lot of the families can't actually use them because they don't have any devices, you know, like printers or or um, anything like that. So I've, I've mentioned that to, to Boris before and um, he's trying to find a way around it um, now. Um yeah, we mentioned that 1.7, yeah, 1.7 million it is that don't qualify for any help. I think you said that before as well, too. Mm. Um, and I guess it comes down to the, um, not just when they're in school, because obviously, obviously at the moment with the pandemic, there are children at home. And so the, the situation is much more um, yeah widespread and, and and exaggerated in a, in a sense by the current situation but even on in normal times the children can get their meal at school but then in the holidays um and at the weekends even they you know they might not get um the food that they need um, exactly. and so one of the other issues is sort of holiday clubs and things and I know you've spoken about that in the past is that yeah. something that you've raised as part of this strategy um not yet, because I feel that if we nail down these things first, then we can, you know, go into into the the holidays and stuff like that um, in a little bit more detail. But for me, we need to get a baseline first. Okay. Um, what a lot of the like a reoccurrence of a topic from from the families is um, stability. A lot of them don't have stability and. Yeah. For me, the only way for them to get stability is for the for the system to sort of benefit them, which it's it's not done for a long time. Um, so once you once you get that baseline, then we can move on to them little things that will give them that you know a little bit of additional help. Um, but yeah, definitely that's something that that can be looked at as well. Um, you know, possibly at a, at a later later stage. Um. Because like you said, for, that was similar to what it was like for me. Um, you know, you have, you almost have less less issues when you are in school because you, you get in the meals and, you know, at school you, you're eating the right foods as well. So, um, yeah, you're sort of just taking over. It, it becomes part of your day to, to have breakfast, um, have a little, little bite to eat at, at break time. And then lunchtime, um, I used to go to after school clubs. Um, so it came it became part of my sort of Monday to Friday, that was my routine and um I was managing to to get a lot of my food from the school system. So that's where that's what benefited me quite a lot. Um and then it meant that my mum knew that I was eating there and she only had to try and prepare for, for one meal. Um so yeah, it helped her out a lot as well. So that's um, that's definitely a, a good point. Um, but I guess as well, um, local teachers in schools here locally have said to me how much they worry about their students during the holidays. And, you know, it's partly that they're not getting food or enough food, yeah. but also that they're not going on day trips and they're not yeah. really, um, you know, they're not, they're not, they're not having as enriching a time as they should be so that they then come back to school and they're behind their peers. Um, yeah. So that's one of the big challenges I think we, we face in Newcastle as well. So, cause I think often food poverty goes hand in hand with the other things that make life enjoyable and enriching yeah. and bring you on educationally as well, like books 
like yeah, this, clothes. It, it leads on to so many other other things, and um, you know, I've tried to like books is a big thing for me because I I never read a book until I was about eighteen, seventeen, or eighteen years old, and what it done for me was um, allowed me to sort of self teach, um, and it's something that I'd I'd never. No one ever put a book in front of my face, basically, and and it was never something to to do when I was younger. Um, yeah, we did it at school and stuff like that, but when you go home, it, it was just it wasn't a thing for um, like in my household, and I know it weren't in some of my friends' households as well. So, um, yeah, sort of one thing will will end up leading to another, and hopefully, I can manage to sort of connect these things together and create a an environment where children have have the correct resources around them to enable to give them the best opportunity at, at whatever it is they want them to do and um that's sort of my that's my long-term picture really the, the three things that you've mentioned are um the 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 thing for the holidays mm. um you know the change of the the system and um the the box they are three things that i think will give uh children the the power and then the knowledge to go on and achieve things that they might not see is, is possible at the time um i know that a lot of people in where i grew up they f they grew up think like accepting that this was their lives forever um and for me it was it's a little bit disheartening to see and um I don't want the the next generation of of children to to think that that's normal to think like that because I feel like people in other areas that aren't may, maybe a a little bit more stable um, at home and you know they are having the the things that we've discussed about um, they they think sky's the limit and for me all children should should have that mindset and um, I think our job is to try and allow them to do that as the best way that we can and all these things that I've that I've got written down here are the only things that I've experienced and what the the other families and uh, children are, are going through now so um the fact that it's so reoccurring is, is what makes me so sure that things need to change because if it was um like I don't know 500 different reasons why why different families are struggling then you know it can be you, you can find yourself nitpicking a little bit but the fact that so many families are saying the same things it just it raises a, a red flag to me and um i believe that if um sort of the government had the 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 information that i have and it spoke to the people that i've spoke to um from all different areas around the country they would they would want to review it and, and change it themselves so um I just want to give them as much of of that knowledge that I have as I can really and um yeah we'll take it take it from there but definitely the 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 biggest change that we can do right now is the the change in the system and um yeah just seeing how the how the government want to want to do it and get it as close to the to the picture that the families need as we can well, um, I don't. I know we can't keep you too long, so um, I just want to say thank you because, um, and, and I know, um, you know, th this is something that you you're doing very much from the heart. But it really is, um, it is really powerful for someone to use the position that you have and the the standing that you have um, to to raise these issues on behalf of the families. And obviously, you have all of these petitioners behind you. Um, and you know we'll we'll take the bat on and we'll do what we can within um, the petitions committee and within Parliament and raising these issues as well. Um, and it's just really really helpful to get your insights and thoughts on it before we do that. And obviously, no doubt we'll be handing the bat on back for you to to carry on as well. So thanks so much for your time no, today, no and just thank you for all the work you're doing as well. Um, no, and no I guess we've got to believe this is going to change things. I, be I believe it will um so i just keep that that mindset really and just always be positive because i think 
like throughout this last year, we've had so many setbacks, but because we've had we've we've took steps in the right direction as well. Nobody speaks about the setbacks, but they're the things that sort of drive me to keep on, you know, doing what I'm doing. And um, until I, I just want there to be a, a fair a fair start at life for for children that are in um, you know more difficult situations and. To be honest, I don't think it's a it's a huge a huge ask really. I think if if they was in the the position um, of of some of these children, they would want the same thing. Um, so I think it's just them seeing where the children are coming from and where the families are coming from. Mm -hmm. And I understand it's not it's sometimes it's not as easy as that because, um, like for example, this this some. Um, like topics that have come up throughout this process that we've been on and I have no experience or, or any knowledge about it. So like just because of the way I've been sort of brought up and um you know what my what my mum always told me, if you don't know about something you shouldn't you shouldn't speak on it. Um and that was where that was where I just got a little bit confused really when the when they started speaking out about things that that they didn't, they hadn't took the time to speak to the families and um, have that understanding and relationship with them. So um, that was where I think once they started to get the information that I've just been like the middleman basically, and once they've got the information, they started to make change. But I think they need to see that even if I didn't do that, they should have been doing that anyway. Um, so yeah, that's that. That's where hopefully we can get to where you don't need somebody in between all of it to to form like a bridge because um, that connection has to be strong. If they're the people that are making the decisions on the future of our country, then they must have a, a strong relationship and and connection with with as many people in the country as they can. So um, I think once once that's understood then more changes will start to happen. I think you're so right, because quite often, you know, we talk about 1.7 million and they're just numbers, they're big numbers, and they don't they don't mean anything sometimes. Whereas real stories, real experiences, real life and real testimony is what mm. um, changes hearts and minds. And, and obviously you've yeah, brought exactly. that very much to the public. So, um, so I think that's what changes things. I think statistics and theories and um you know don't don't often make yeah. the impact that they should i want it so thank you so much and we'll take it away and obviously um i'm sure you'll keep an eye on what the petitions committee is doing and we'll take evidence and we'll we'll get into all the numbers and the theories yeah. and all of that but i think um you just keep doing what you're doing which is bringing the real life stories and how this can really make a difference in yeah. real people's lives which i think is really what has the powerful the power to change yeah okay no problem thanks so much it's lovely to meet thank you thank you very much nice to meet you as well